Welcome to this recording of the NMRA PCR Coast Division Saturday Virtual Event, recorded October 10th, 2020, 9 to 11 a.m. Our first topic today is acrylic to plexiglass structures. And our first speaker is Paul Ingram talking about a station he built. Paul? Back in 2012, it was the centennial celebration for the city of Sunnyvale here. And uh, for that, I built a diorama of the Sunnyvale station area in N scale. And uh, included in that were a set of the three stations going back to 1864, and then the uh, 1901 one, and then the 1952 one. I did not model the current uh, parking garage. Uh, to start with, this this is the first uh, the first slide, and this is the uh, description that I wrote up to put with the display. And um, as you can see, there's a lot of glass in this, uh, in this structure. And uh, I decided instead of trying to make a whole bunch of separate little windows, why not use uh, plexiglass to make the basic structure of the, of the glass on both sides of the building? So you can see here in the building, there's a lot of it. This is the track side of, of the thing. In the background, there's a gantry crane, which is no longer there. Uh, so uh, let's go to the next slide, uh, Phil. So here's some of the, the materials that I did. Uh, on the bottom is the uh, plan for the station, which I got from the California State Railroad Museum. So I had good references for that. And as uh, you can see, there's a couple pictures. I found pictures in a lot of places. The uh, History Museum was able to give me some. And I found some in various places online and in, uh, in books and so forth. And uh, then on the, uh, on the red sheet, you can see to the right above the scale rule, that's the basic framing that I did. And that's cut from plexiglass. It's about 60 thousandths, I guess, or a tenth of an inch uh, thickness, whatever it is, for the basic uh, framing. And then over to the left are the pieces in styrene that I cut to build up the roof that goes uh, on, on top of that. And if we can go to the next one. There's a close-up of the of the plexiglass construction that that forms the basis uh, of the building. Uh, the little pillar in the front, as you as you see on the on the photo of the uh, real station, that's a pillar near the entrance on the street side. So you're looking at the street side of that. And next slide, please. And uh, oops, uh, you want. You want number four. Yeah, and that's a close up of the roof parts. So I built those up with a, uh, that's just uh, like 40,000 styrene and some 20,000s and just built up the basic framing for that. Uh, so you've got the roof and then the supports and then the pieces lying around the outside are the sloped parts of the roof that will be uh, glued onto, in, onto that. And next picture. So here's the, the plexiglass base, and I've mounted it on some evergreen styrene uh, sidewalk material for the, for the uh, inside because that's what the floor was. Um, because this is in scale and because it was a display inside the museum, I didn't do any interior uh, modeling on this one. So that's why that happened. Now, if you look over to the upper left, you can see the roof. It's been completed and I put a base coat of red on it because that was what the roof was. And then lying around it, uh, top and bottom and on the ends are some overlays that I made on styrene uh, to go on both sides of the, uh, of the plexiglass. The plain ones at the, at the inner edges are for the inside of the plexiglass and the colored ones there with the painted window frames and so forth will be glued to the outside of the frame. And then that will, that will complete the building. Um, you could also have, I could also have done this a different way and that would have been to use the photographs, put them through Photoshop, similar to what Earl had described in one of his uh, clinics uh, and done it uh, photographically and had, uh, had a detail done that way. Um, but I just, because it's such a plain building, uh, as far as the finish with stucco and so forth, I decided I would do uh, cutouts in the styrene to make those facing pieces. So next photo. So this is a picture of the finished uh, model from the street side. 
Um, I apologize for the quality of the, of the photography on this one, but uh, you can see how, how that all worked when you glue the, the pieces on the, uh, on the outside. And then I mounted it on a, on a base of uh, just black uh, acrylic to drop into the diorama. Um, all of the three stations are built on the same size base, so they can be interchanged depending on what train you want to display. Uh, and the final slide. There's a picture from the track side. Uh, and uh, that's just set up with a piece of uni track in front uh, for that. If you want to see the work in its final form and they ever reopen the museum, uh, you'll, you'll see it down at the Sunnyvale uh, Heritage Park Museum uh, in Sunnyvale. Um, and it's now, it now belongs to the uh, museum. It's actually built as a fully operational module. And uh, during the 2012 ce centennial celebrations, we set it up and I put a short staging yard at each end of it and ran trains of various vintages while I talked about them for the, for the uh, visitors to see. So that's what I've got. If you've got any questions or anything, uh, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Comments or thoughts? I, it's very interesting because your thought process very much mimics what what I what I was going through when I started building. So, uh, very interesting. Yeah, I think Chris uh, put a question out. Uh, did you cover what a, what adhesive you used to put the sides onto the acrylic? Um, you could use just an, either of the plastic ones, but what I got was a special acrylic uh, glue from Tap Plastics. Um, and I put it on with a little syringe just along the joints, and then it was sucked in and, and attached mm -hmm. by a capillary action. So um, it's, actually... really, it's really important to try and keep that as clean as possible or you, if you can mess up the windows really fast if you're not careful. I actually just did that. And when I show you why, I, I actually did that three or four days ago. And what you do is you tap sells you a little can of, of glue, and you open it up and punch the top. And then they sell you a little bottle that's got a basically a wire on the top and you just kind of put it at the top and let it run down. And, and you're right. I had one point where it flicked on me and it flicked across and I actually had to position a window because I got a little bit on the, the plexiglass there. I'll add, yeah, that's exactly I, I, the point I'd use. Yep. I'll add a cautionary note about the adhesive. I've also used it for an acrylic Charlie, kit. Right. And it, the, the no. adhesive is highly volatile it evaporates extremely quickly and the seal, the, the metal can has metal threads and they don't seal that well. So I started my acrylic kit, got the adhesive, opened it, set the project aside for various reasons for about six months. And when I came back over three quarters of the adhesive had evaporated out of the can and I had just enough to finish the kit. So if you open the can, use it, uh, maybe seal it in a plastic bag or something, but it's highly volatile. You know, I wonder if what would work this what I do with flocal paints because the flocal paints are so valuable now. Is I took a, a plastic bag, just a sandwich bag, you know, um, whatever it is, the Ziplocs, and I cut pieces out about inch and a half square and put them on the can and screw them down inside the lid as a seal. I wonder if you could do the same thing, just cut a little piece of that kind of plastic and screw it down in the metal lid to, to provide a gasket on the threads. Right, yeah, that's uh, good, good, good. I've got a can sitting in my garage, Chris. I'm going to go down and do that after this call. That was great, great. I was worried about the bottle sitting there that it would evaporate. I made the assumption the can was safe, and clearly was that was just, a bad assumption. I would just wonder if plain old cockpit glue wouldn't work. I, I so I got. I'll show you what I did. So I so my let me walk through why I, why we actually had the conversation here. So let me um. Let me get out of this and jump over to a different slide hey, here. Paul, well, Phil's doing that. I have a question for you. How did you keep the small cross sections from warping when you glued it all together? Um, this was a fairly uh, rigid piece of plastic, so I never had any problem with warping. Okay, I just know sometime with the you know narrow tops and bottoms you had there that you know, if that glue gets in there, it tends to warp it a little bit. Now, I, I think part of it is, is if you apply it not to, you know, very sparingly, that uh, you can mitigate a lot of that problem. It doesn't, because you're not, you're not softening as much surface. 
So, so anyway, this is what I'm doing is building a warehouse. This is on, on the module. The picture at the top is one of the few pictures I have of actually warehouses that were in the area. Uh, kind of amazing that nobody seems to take pictures of things like that. They just came and went without any real record. Um, so this is actually the, what I did was design, started with wanting to have a wood frame building. I actually decided to go with board and batten siding instead of horizontal siding. Um, but as I thought about it, the problem with this is when you see this building, which is 20 inches long and eight inches wide, is built on a base that's removable from the module because what I found is when you run these things through a trailer to take them to an event, they bounce really hard in the trailer. And if you put any details or anything on them, they just break off. So I decided I wanted to make the buildings because I wanted to be able to have details in them, make them removable. So I built a base that's basically a masonite base with a, spa with a wood piece that centers it in a base on the module. And I wanted to be able to remove it. So I wanted it to be strong and I wanted to be able to pick it up. And as I thought about how to do that, my concern was building a more traditional stick type model uh, wouldn't have the strength. So I thought about it and said, well, maybe if I built it out of plexiglass, it'd have the strength and then it could actually also be the glazing. So this is actually the plan of the plexiglass. And I, I kind of use a combination of scale and the, the inches are seven inches are real inches. The scale is scale. And essentially what it did was laid out the plexiglass pieces and let me lay out the interior, as you'll see. Uh, this is actually because I'm doing the interior printed. I actually ended up doing three, um, sub I looked at three different wall options and I talked with my wife and she decided that she liked the right one of those three. Uh, the rest of the pictures in here are actually the, um, are actually the, um, um, are just other pictures of, of details. But what I do have, what I also have is, this is actually how I printed out the walls. So what I've done is I'm actually doing very much the same thing that Paul did. I'm actually designing the building on the inside and then transcribing that to the outside. So if you look at this thing, you really can't see it very well, but this is a window. Um, and what I did when I designed this was I actually used the window and positioned it, and then you print this out and cut it out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to grab my phone, and I'll go show you actually how this looks when you start putting it together. Because I actually got one wall that the outside wall is done and the inside wall. So I'll be back in just a second on my phone. Welcome. So if you're watching the recording, this section of the video was actually redone. Um, it actually was redone because uh, it was not spotlighted and you really couldn't see it. So anyway, the, the purpose of this is primarily to look at the plexiglass buildings, but I thought I'd just do a, a brief walkthrough. This is um, the Moss Landing HON30 layout I've been building. Um, so kind of walk down along here. This is essentially a recreation of if Moss Landing had had a harbor dredging um, in the teens in 1910 instead of in 19. 47. But anyway, so we have a, a siding and a, a station here, my mock water tower and an outhouse to kind of complete the scene area. Um, and then over here, we have a car float on the lower level. And then the causeway, which exits to the next module down the center. Um, so around here, um, we actually have this would be where the slough would have come out and Elkhorn slough and then this is on the side where there was the little bay that would have gone out to the ocean. Um, the fuel dock here is actually modeled after the standard oil pier at Monterey. Uh, it's actually fairly close to it. Um, now this is the first of the plexiglass buildings. Um, this one is actually going to be modeled somewhat after the Hobden refinery which later after it was torn down became the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, so what you see is that all the buildings actually are on bases and you can see that base here and you actually see the base comes out over the uh, over the piers there um, and that actually will will represent um, the dock in front for the fish uh, fish landing. Um, so this is a station it's based on the SP single room Garibaldi station um, and will be the, the Moss Landing Station. Uh, and then these are the other two structures. Um, 
And what you can see here is you can see how they look. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is putting interiors in these that will probably be made out of paper, um, but with some wood for lining. And then the exteriors will be finished in wood. So essentially the plexiglass will be um, the framing and foundation. So um, you, know, you can take the roof off like this. And then the whole building itself is actually on a base. And I'm going to pause this and then I'm going to reset it up so I can show you how um, the building can be, is going to be lined and how it can be removed. So what I've done now is I actually put um, an initial set of interior walls in here. I wanted to show you how this works. So I'm going to go ahead and take this car out. Um, so the buildings just lift out. And this was why I built them out of plexiglass, was so they'd be easy to be removed. So this one comes out, you know, so it's got a plug to plug it in because it's got the track and um, eventually the elbow. So this is, is actually my intent to do the end wall. So by putting the windows directly into the wood, you can actually put them directly in. And I matched up the interiors to the exteriors. In fact, I made the exterior walls to match the interior printed walls. So if I, if I take the roof off here, um, which you actually can see in these, unfortunately a couple of these fell down, the static cling that I had when I initially printed them is gone. So what I've done is I've made templates for all the walls. Um, I've actually decided not to go with the board and batten siding. I'm going to go with horizontal siding. So these, I'll just change the wood that's in there. And I've actually been do looking at a couple of different types of, of wood here for the interior. Um, of course, they're going to be this way now. So um, anyway, so that's uh, looking at plexiglass buildings. Um, again, they're all built so you can remove them. So you know, literally, you can just take this and pick it up, and it comes off the off the layout very simply. It would be nice if I'd moved the truck so the truck didn't take a fall into the water. Anyway, with that, I'll go back to the session and back to the original recording of the meeting on Saturday. Thanks. While he's getting back to his computer, this is Steve. I wanted to see if you guys can hear me. I switched computers because my sound in Zoom meetings has always been cutting out if I talk for like uh, 30 seconds. Can you hear me? We, we can hear you, Steve, but there's echo. So you may have to get earbuds or he a headset eventually because the you're using speakers, I think, and it feed, feeds back into your microphone. But yeah, you can be heard. I think that echo is coming from the fact that I have two machines on. I'll turn off the other machine when I come back. Or just mute it or possibly turn down the volume of your speaker. Yeah. But yeah, you sound good. Chris is the hard one. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Yeah, Chris, your volume sounds low compared to everybody else. Uh, thank you. I'll see what I can do. But by the way, if, if, if anyone doesn't have a camera, there's an Aver camera at Costco for 55 bucks. Um, I know Aver, I actually done some work with them. They, their US headquarters used to be in Fremont, right on Mission Boulevard there where you come under, come off of 880 there on the left at Mission and, uh, and um, Warm Springs. And it's a good camera, it's a 1080 for 55 bucks with dual mic. So if, if you don't have a camera, and have not figured out, you know, are using the camera and your laptop, which suck because of the position of the screen and you're watching them. It's a good $55 investment, I bet. I didn't buy one because I have a couple, but if I didn't have one, I would have bought one. Phil, what was your technique for cutting the plexiglass? Um, you had the door cutouts and the slanted roof line. So I actually used three things, but only two of them I would use again. Most of the main cuts were just done on a table saw. So I have one of those Craftsman table saws that's like a suitcase where it's on wheels and you can roll it out so I can set it up. And I just roll it out, set it up, and cut them. So all of the main cuts were done on, this, on the table saw. The win And the doors, the cuts up on the doors were done on the table saw. I actually did the cross cuts on a band. I have a band saw too, and I did them on the band saw. But in the end, most of the cuts I finally were done. I have one of those hobby vibrating saws. I don't know what they're called, but they have the, they take a little piece of wire or piece of saw about this long. They clamp and it goes up and down. You can open it and take it out. It's a, 
I don't know what the brand is, but those saws are excellent. Like the cutouts for the windows on the wood, I just did those with that. I literally laid the paper on, marked it, drew it, drilled a hole through, and you can put that blade through the hole and then just cut it out. And it lets you do a, if you just concentrate on keeping the blade right on the line as you go, you can do incredibly good cutouts with it. And it cuts through the plexiglass great and the wood great. So, yeah, that's one, that's a tool. I don't know. I, I think my parents gave it to me when I was younger. I think I've had it for 40 years, but it's a, you know, one of those, it's a saw that's, it's got a big kind of thing that goes around. It's got a blade out in a little table. It's called a scroll saw. Scroll saw. Scroll saw. Scroll saw. Yeah, if you don't have one of those, that's a great tool. So, and then the glue, the glue is just, so what I do is I glued the plastic frame and made it up as a frame with the corner clamp blocks that you get for putting clips to the, those brass corner clamp blocks. And I put those on and then just let the capillary auction take the glue in. And when that was all done, I basically turned it over and just put a layer of epoxy all the way around it and then just set it down on the bottom, put a couple of pieces of plywood and a couple of, of jar, you know, uh, a gallon of acetone and some glue on, on it for weights and just let the epoxy set. But I'm actually really, it really does seem like it's a pretty strong structure, so. I know on my model, it's its extremely strong too, and you can handle it and it's, it's not a problem. As far as what I did for mine, since it's just fairly thin stuff, it was just a, a score and snap and then clean it up with a file. Yeah. Um, if you give me the screen for a second, I'll show you. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't do it yet. I will do it right now. You are set. Oh, great. Okay, let's see. Um, this building has like no detail at all, just a little bit of strip for downspouts and a couple of roof greebles. But uh, this is like 10 years old, and it's uh, meant to be the back of a building at Numi, as you can see. And it's about three feet long, and we were concerned about rigidity. So uh, in this case, I had a piece of uh, plexi about I don't know, 15 inches high and three feet wide. And uh, little bit of paint and uh, uh, I think we skinned this with uh, evergreen styrene so it uh, looks like a sheet metal building. It's not fancy but what it does do is give you a really rigid surface so nothing has popped out and it's uh, you know it's great it's been stable for a long time. Went back and did it I'd probably add some more lighting to it so you know that'll be something in the next year or two. Uh, but, you know, Plexi is a great tool. You should have it in your kit. And let me release the sharing. Well, it, you know, it's an interesting thought process, right? Because I, you know, kind of, if you build a kit, build a model and try to make it as a stick, a, pro, a real stick representation of the physical reality, it's going to have a certain, certain level of fragility. And so when you're building something to be on a model module where it's going to be handled five or six times a year for the next 10 years, I think building for longevity of the structure itself is actually more important. So it's kind of like, can you build a frame that's incredibly solid and then wrap around it modeling? So when you look at it from the outside, it actually looks like it was a board for board model. I think that's a, it's an interesting different challenge than building kind of a quote, a, a true contest level model. Yeah, I think you see a lot of that, I think, on, on layout level models. I mean, it's, it's great. You can add a lot of detail, but particularly on an operating model, you need to be very concerned. You know, people are going to be reaching in and you want to build something that's solid and will, you know, you know certainly take incidental. <coughs> I think with, as with all techniques, there are, there are trade-offs. Uh, I used acrylic to build a depot kit. And the one thing I liked was, it is really fast. The adhesive sets literally instantly. <laughs> uh, you get your corners mechanically aligned. You you add a, a tiny bit of adhesive. It instantly enters the joint by capillary action. And three seconds later, you could throw it on the ground and it, it, it would be fine. Uh, the, the downside is cutting window and door openings. Um, I, I don't think there's any simple way to do that unless you use really thin material. Yeah, but it built up into a really nice model. I took a look at the article while you were talking, and uh, you know, that's very nice. I think anybody would be happy to have that on their layout. 
uh, well, they, the kit manufacturer, of course, had cut the windows and doors. I guess I'm thinking about scratch building. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but you're, but yeah, I think it, I think everyone should, should try it at least once. And that's why I got that kit. Yeah. The other thing Seth has on the layout that we didn't talk about is there are, I think, Seth's two or three buildings that are acrylic with plastic overlays. Yes. We just cut out for the windows and stuck the windows on. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. Um, Franklin Brewer Distilleries and um, uh, boy, there's at least one other. The other one behind Smurfit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then there's, uh, yeah. You know, I understand, Chris, I looked at that kit and that, you know, actually you could, with the scroll saw, I think you could do those windows pretty easily. Um, I, I, guys, I was pretty impressed with literally cutting out the, the, the two. Now, I'm not cutting out window because I'm using the, the plexiglass as glazing for the windows. But when I cut out like the door openings and that, I think you could do windows or any other sort of openings. And if you're building at NHO, you probably wouldn't buy that thick. You know, they have 1 16th too. So you could actually go a little bit thinner also. But yeah, no, it's pretty interesting tech, pretty interesting um, materials to use. Phil, how does the, the saw leave the edge of the, the, the cut edge of the opening? So I, the saw blade I have is not a really, really fine saw blade. It's kind of more of a general purpose blade. And I thought about buying a special blade and I didn't after I tried it. You get a little chipping at the edge, but not much. Um, you know, it, it, if you look at it, the edges are pretty clean. I'll go, I'll go, in fact, I'll put this on pause. I'll go grab a, I have a scrap laying in my bedroom. I'll go grab it and I'll bring it over and you can see where the cuts were. They, they really weren't bad at all. And the scroll saw cuts are just perfect. I mean, they're, you practically can't even tell they're cut. They're just a smooth cut. It, the only thing there is you sometimes get a little plastic, heat plastic that rubs off on the bottom. You have to break off when you get done with the cut. But no, it, it works pretty well. And, and like I said, I, what impressed me, I was worried about the thickness of the plastic where you have a window where you've got a frame on the outside and you've got something on the inside. Could you see that kind of that, when you look down that angle, could you see the thickness? And it doesn't look to me like with the a tenth, that's really going to be a big problem. I think it's going to pretty much look, pretty much look like glazing. So. Um, I also use uh, plexiglass for doing control panels and, uh, and that kind of stuff too. And uh, I picked up a couple of the plastic cutting blades from TAP and they cut pretty clean. And then just to finish up, you can use a, you know, a fine tooth file or some fine sandpaper to get the, uh, the edges and everything right. And, and by the way, so my thought process on this was that the edges are never gonna be seen, right? Because the edges are all being glued at the corners or even where there's a door opening. When I get done, those are gonna get lined with wood all the way around, you know, I'll put strip wood all the way around the door opening. So you'll never see the plexiglass there. So the fact that there are a few, it might not be perfectly clean, really didn't matter because everywhere there was, there was sawing was gonna be hidden. What I was really concerned about was the plexiglass out in the middle where it was gonna be the glazed window. So yeah, it's, we'll see when it gets done. It'll be interesting. Hopefully, and hopefully when we get to, uh, to July and the con the convention, we'll be able to all share at that. Yeah, give, give me a moment here. I think I can get the other one that that uh, Earl just mentioned up. So let me. Uh, I'll just quick. I'll just quickly mention that if you're drilling into Plex, it's really good to get the plastic, the boring bits because they have a sharper tip and they won't chip out. Um, a wood boring. Uh, drill bit will chip out pretty easily with Plex. And by the way, the other thing I always do is if the plastic that they put on it isn't good on it, just run a piece of tape down where you're going to cut. And that always seems to help with the chipping too. Sure. You know, just, and also it's nice to mark. If you're going to, you know, if you're making a cut line, you put a piece of tape there, mark the tape and then cut it. And it tends to reduce the, the edge chipping. So um, if I can enter, you know, Go. Who's there? The um, the bottom, and you'll you'll see on this layout, pretty much everything is either a liquor distributor or something in the uh, materials industry. But uh, these are real rail served industries. So, uh, bottomly here, uh, 
is another plexiglass one and you can see we just uh, skinned it and put, uh, no, those are actually not even skinned. It was mask painted and then we uh, uh, laser cut some uh, window frames and uh, uh, used uh, Killer Red, you know, double stick carrierless tape to hold the frames on. And, uh, you know, it's fairly convincing. Uh, looks like one of my light fixtures is out of alignment. Um, and let me see here, can I uh, get back in, hang on, uh, and move that, um, come on up, hmm. sorry there. Yeah, it's clear for modern buildings, it's probably a great technique because they are so plain, so many yeah. of them. And here's another one, basically the same thing, there's a little bit of an interior on the, uh, uh, upstairs office, uh, you know, once again, and, and not much to this, right? The, um, you know, some strip for, for downspouts. We had a little, uh, Jason Hill did a 3D down, you know, scupper for me. Uh, we got some uh, cameras. Those were 3D printed, but Walters makes them now. Um, again, the laser cut uh, uh, window frames uh, and just a bunch of uh, uh, Walters roof greebles. And uh, actually, a couple of these are, are, are knobs and you can pop that out. And it's a place where all the removable loads for the gondolas are stored. So, you know, very you know, very modest building, but very functional and practical. Um, so let me get it back. Anyway, neat stuff you can do. So anyone else got a share? We'll jump to some, jump to just general shares and the models of the week. Here you go, and I'll just take a couple seconds for this. Cool. I, recent, I recently built the Showcase Miniatures Citrus Packing Shed. It's a kit that a lot of people have built. Uh, usually it's white and doesn't have the stacks on top. Um, the red color and the use of the stacks. I, I uh, have a hat tip to Jason Jensen. He, he built it uh, basically the same. Uh, so this was a, a front view. It's a, a narrow uh, background low profile kit. It's about an inch and three quarters wide. Um, I added a few details like the stacks on top with the bracing. Uh, the sign is custom printed on my, just on an inkjet printer and then framed with strip wood. Uh, there's a 3D printed uh, electrical box on the far left side and uh, just some basic details on the, on the platform. Since this was finished, I've added some lighting over the doors over the main freight doors as well with uh, miniature LEDs. So there you go. That's my building of the week. Cool. Nice. Chalk weathering or pan pastel weathering. Chris just mentioned Jason Jensen, and I've mentioned him before on some of these talks too. I don't know if you guys have seen his newest, he's doing like a science fiction diorama in three parts. And the newest part actually has some really good weathering information. So even though it's not model railroad centric, you know, it's a uh, it's really good weathering. There's another uh, video on YouTube that I saw this laser creation world. And I think I just put a link up there. He's got some diorama. He's kind of like Chuck Doan-ish kind of thing. Uh, but he's got some interesting weathering with, with acrylics where he's got an old truck. He's got some basic weathering. Then he wets it all down and then does weathering on top of the wet, which is really nice for getting streaks to come down. So I'm going to be playing with that and we'll see how that works. But, uh, it's an interesting video to go see. It's half in, it's all in German and English subtitles and uh, got some good techniques in there.
So I got something here real quick. You can probably see my uh, workbench there. Can everybody see that? Yep. So what I did here is um, this is building uh, coils for a, uh, a cooling plant, ventilation shed. So I bought the Walther's uh, refinery pipes kit, put them all together. This will be sprayed with, uh, with silver, and you'll see it at roughly this angle from above. You won't see any of the edges of it. But it was a quick way. All these pipes are connected together. They come to you in pieces like this which if you've ever screwed around trying to glue pipes together evenly, this is a real time saver. So, you know, this took, I don't know, half hour to glue them all together end to end and just have them set like that for a quick building interior that looks pretty industrial. Cool. Well, I guess, uh, you know, some, Phil asked me if I just take a quick look at my layout and I was trying to figure out how to use the, uh, the, the, the camera, uh, on my phone rather than, than the, the, the 800 pixel, uh, one I use for, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to see how it does. I guess that's what it's doing. Are, are, okay. Are you joined on the phone? Because you're there. Yeah, actually, Adams I've got the phone. phone on right now. Okay. So it's not sending video, though. Huh? It's not sending video. Yeah. Ask to start video. Hang on. I just asked you to start video. Oh, it says start my video. Allow. Boom, yeah. Allow. There you are. Now okay. we see you. Now, if if you look on the upper. So turn your turn your phone horizontal so flip that there you go now it should the picture should change the, uh, up well, that was weird now is it is your phone vertical or horizontal it's vertical right now oh, flip it back to horizontal the way you had it that was good <laughs> and then at the at the top of the screen there should be a button that looks like a camera with two circular arrows around it and the top no. of the zoom screen there should be a little image that looks like a camera and it's got two arrows above and below that and there that Ah, oh, there it is. Hang on. There, I got it. Okay, yeah, now, okay, cool. Yep, now we got it. So hang on, let me let me spotlight you now. Oh, did I spotlight the wrong one? I may have spotlighted the wrong one. Okay. Oh, anyway, I guess I have to turn this around. I can't use the back camera. The uh, little selfie switch doesn't work for you? Yeah, there's a switch. Oh, on well. There. I'll have to work this out because we shouldn't be doing this on the... Uh... Yeah, give, give me a call and we'll we'll work through it. And okay. Uh, well, in the meantime, what I'll do is I'll just grab the, uh, the, the portable camera. Hey Ken, unmute your unmute your phone. Oh well. Hey Ken, we can't hear you. Need to unmute your phone there. Uh, okay. Yeah, and there. there you go. Yeah, it was we we're getting feedback, but yeah, I think it, so the problem is between the two devices. I'm it's not working. Hey, so hang on. now it should be fine. I muted your phone. Yeah, yeah. So, you probably know that's need all right. I, 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 um, I think you and I need to have a little session yeah, and we'll you... get it all settled out so that we can exactly I can use the two devices and. Yeah, so what I do, by the way, when I go, what you guys didn't see is I have a second set of headphones that are actually 
also lined up to my phone. Uh, I actually left these headphones with the computer, connected to the computer. When I went to the phone, it's actually separate, and I wasn't in the same room. And, and that was – it kind of works out well that way to use the phone, kind of yeah. completely separate. Yeah, um, well, the problem is I'm in the same room. That's all I've got is yeah. one little tiny room. Well, so next time, we, next time you do it, what we want to do is mute your computer and mute the video on your computer and then go to the phone. I'll, I'll walk you through it. We'll have a quick call and go through it. Okay. And, and by the way, for anybody else, if you want to, if you want to try it, you know, send me an email. We can get on a video and walk through it. I, you know, we've done that a couple of folks and it's pretty quick and easy to go through and figure out how to use this stuff. Phil, let, you know, my time's pretty open. So let me know when you're available. Cool. Cool. Yep. It's a, it's a great way to, you know, learn about it and make some stuff, but. Yeah. So I could uh, share a building I built probably early this uh, pandemic. <laughs> I think back in February after this together. <laughs> I, I guess I should. Oh, here we go. So can you see my desktop? Excellent. We sure can. Yeah. So so this is just a couple of photos I had on my uh, PC. I can't remember what kit this is, um, but uh, it's, I'm one of those that loves the detail insides. And so, there we go. So it's painted with just the uh, hobby acrylic paint. Um, the Michaels brand stuff is actually what I used. Um, and so I, I put on, you know, a, a, a light box on the back. Then I 3D printed all the parts that you see on the inside. So I, I did up some bookcases and some filing cabinets and a clock. Do you, do you have your own printer or do you use a print service? I've got two 3D printers at home. I've ah, got an cool. SLA printer and a resin printer. These are all resin printers. Um, SLA printers, they're the additive ones. Um, they're great for big structures, but for little fine details, you really want a resin printer. Um, and so, and then I also like to light all of my buildings. Um, so when the lights are on, Actually, like the, uh, the lamp here and the, the uh, heater, that's not true. That's uh, outside of that. But um, I found you can get the little um, micro LEDs, and they're like my new favorite thing. It's so it's like small. So I've got another one. Um, <laughs> but this was my February. Cool. Beautiful. Yeah, but you, you can see where I've got to do So, so how do you find working with the resin printer and the resin? It's been an interesting learning experience. So far, the only resin I can speak well with is Hey Jonathan, can you get a little closer to your microphone? We're we're your mic isn't picking you up very well. Hmm. You may want to check. You may want to check next to the mute button. There's a little up arrow. You may want to click uh, on that because uh, uh. it may actually not be your headset that's connected. It may yep. be your. How's this? That's yeah, much about, better. Much better. Yep. Yeah, yeah I, I switched to the headset for the audio, and I thought it moved the the or sorry the what I you can hear, but it didn't move the speaker. Go figure, or the microphone. Anyway, um, so back on the resin resin print, resin resin that I use, um, I'm using any Cubics resin. They're green resin. I've finally figured out the right settings to get good prints from that. I have gray and clear, and I have yet to get those to print. Um, so it's finicky. I'm still learning. Did you buy the Inicubic printer too then? Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay, that, that, the reason I'm asking, that was the one I kind of looked at, but I've kind of stayed away from it. There seems to be kind of a bad reputation of resin as being kind of icky and dangerous, so to speak. It. Uh, so I did build myself a, a vent chamber for it because it smells, it stinks up everything. Um, and so I vent it directly outside. Um, and I, I always wear gloves and it, it is sticky and messy to work with. But when you, you get something printed, it's amazing what it can do. 
and I actually have the uh, AnyCubic uh, Proton S, um, and it's been a good printer. I haven't had any complaints. Their customer service has been great. I, when I got it, I was having a few problems. They sent me repair parts, no charge, a whole new LCD screen and whatnot. Um, so it's been good from that perspective. It's finding the right um, recipe to actually print something with resin. That's been an interesting experience. Interesting. It's good. That might that might be a, an interesting clinic actually to do at some point if you if you were comfortable about you know how using a resin 3D printer. I I've seen the stuff that Luke Toen does, mm -hmm. but he's getting paid by AnyCubic. I think he's kind okay. of they're sponsoring him. So he, I don't think he talks about the challenges like you talked about about the difference in color and getting stuff printed. I. I think that's great, great info to understand, you know, before you make a 500, because it's about a $500 investment to get one from what I can figure. And it'd just be really to know, good to know before you make a $500 investment, how complicated it's going to be. And it sounds like you've gone through the process and that would be a, if, yeah, John, if you can give me a buzz and maybe think about doing a, a quick overview of it and what your experience has been with, it'd be great. I know we were going to do one at the PCR convention on, um, on, um, um the cutco or cutter you know the oh, right the tools. Chris cut great yeah exactly and and this is to my mind very similar i mean price wise quite frankly from my perspective i was trying to think about do i if i want to buy something which one would i buy and i've kind of after doing some cutting now with the with the scroll so i've kind of come back because the 3d printer may be a much more effective thing to buy for details so I'd love to learn about that. That's, yeah, that's... yeah, yeah. I'd be happy to to share what I've learned and the yeah. setup and whatnot. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of one of those. I ended up going down the resin printer. I had an SLA printer for quite a while. Um, I did the resin printer because my son is into miniature gaming and he wanted to print some miniature figures, and so that was the impetus for us to like get it together. Yep. And there's a lot of support stuff you need around the printer to really be safe and get good prints um and so i could and actually the back to that building that back room i want to put a a uh, printing press in it and so i can walk through how did i find a design to use and then actually get that printed up and kind of walk through that whole process that, that would be great that, that would be absolutely great did you buy the did you buy their finisher or did you make one i made one okay that, that would also be cool to cover because so for those of you who don't know when you do the resin it has to be uv hardened after you print the part you have to go through a, and jonathan knows this better than i do so the company that makes the printer prints a thing that you can do that in or you can make one yourself and it costs like 200 bucks so you can save probably 150 or 170 bucks by making it yourself so yeah great. i yeah i ended up um putting together my own washer um yep. and then i i actually built a little box and and got a a, a uv lamp off of amazon that i kind of fitted into it and so i've got my own own curing station and that's what i meant by kind of there's a lot of stuff you need a support structure around it from ventilation to post-processing of the actual figures um so I've, I've i've learned all that or I'm i'm still learning but i'd be happy to share Excellent, excellent. Jonathan, you mentioned the DCC test board. Yeah, um, that one I don't have any pictures of, and I'm in, right in the middle of pulling that together. So next time we get together, I'll, I'll throw together a few slides. But that's another thing that I, I was inspired by something I saw on the internet, and so I'm building one of my own. I'm one of those SM3 guys, and so I, I've got to do a lot of custom stuff because, you know, <laughs> there's not as much available for SM3, so I had to 3D print my own pieces for it. So, and I'll, I'll share that next time. Thanks. Cool. Well, so I, I think we probably we're at, we're probably at a point where unless there's other things to share, or maybe we're probably at a, a place to close off. Sounds good. Good, James, Jim. Did you were you waving goodbye, or do you have something to waving goodbye? So if if there's no more, I think we'll just call it a, a day. Um, so two weeks will be the um, the Frank Markovich 
one o'clock and I'll put that in the extra next week. Um, and by the way, if anybody has anything they want to put in the extra about anything outside and send me an email and I'll put it in there. I kind of, kind of going to use that, I think for the rest of the year, since we don't have, um, we don't have, we're not going to have any events for the rest of the year, just a way to kind of send information out. So, and then we'll plan on four weeks from now. And I, I will be definitely hitting up Jonathan to, to look at a, uh, at talking about 3d printing and, uh, and, and also um, we're getting Ken up about potentially doing some uh, layout visits. So and if anyone else has anything, please send it to me. So everybody have a great week or two weeks, and we will see you in a couple of weeks. So Phil, my sound's coming through okay now? Yeah, it's coming through good now. All right, yeah, I turned off the sound on the other machine because yep. the public meetings I've got a chair, uh, it, it's been a pain. And so I figured I'd try another Mac I have. This yep. one's obviously staying uh, working fine. All yep. right. Thanks. Appreciate yeah, it. You know, and, and by the way, the reason, the reason the headsets, headphones work so well for this, just for everybody, a lot of times the computers, if your computer is running a lot of other applications, it can interfere with the echo cancellation in the computer. And that's when you get that kind of or noises mm -hmm. that are random. So one of the other things is if, if you're doing this, it's yeah. almost worth turning off app background applications. By the way, the worst is Chrome. Um, if you use Chrome as a browser and you have 30 windows open, it'll <laughs> suck up half your memory on your system. And that can cause problems for this kind of thing. That's a good observation. I'll make sure when I'm doing Zoom, yeah. from now on, turn everything else off. Yeah. It's just, it, it, so a lot of times when you have problems there, it's actually, people think it's the network. A lot of times it's actually your computer is getting overloaded and it's right. interfering with the processes because the video takes a lot of computer power. So True, true. Process cool. sharing. All right. Thanks again We're for back, doing everybody. It. Have a great week. Thank and you, we Bill. Thanks, hey. guys. Bye nice. now.